I feel like I'm a pretty good example of the fact that drug addiction doesn't really have like a doesn't really stop when it sees like a socioeconomic barrier. There's nothing that's going to be like, oh, sorry, you can't come in here. Um, I, I had a fantastic childhood. <laughs> There's nothing that happened in my childhood that I can say, you know, that was it. That's what, you know, caused all this to happen. I had a therapist when I was little after my brother died. I was two and a half, I think. And at that age, I, this is kind of eerie, but the, the therapist said to my mom one day, um, Chaley has a very strong-willed personality, and it's the type of thing where she can either be very ridiculously successful or she could crash and burn. It just gives me chills, you know? From a young age, I was put on medication. I think in my head, pills fix things. I just remember thinking, oh, this, this feels good. But I was never able to admit that I liked it at that point. From there, went to drinking, smoking weed, that kind of stuff together. And then to Coke and crack. Um, I started using Coke when I was about 15. If you had something that was going to make me feel outside of myself, if I didn't think it was gonna kill me, I was gonna do it. Once I got to heroin was when, you know, all bets were off, I was willing to do anything. I shot it for the first time when I really, you know, started using. And from, from then on, you know, just every day from the first time I did it just the, the most relaxing feeling you could imagine. The person that I am when I'm using heroin is just like the, the, the polar opposite of the person that I actually am. Even when I knew my parents knew I was lying, I would still defend that lie to the death. When I was 18, I, I prostituted for the first time. I stole from a lot of people, mainly my brother. My brother would, he was really good at saving money when he was younger and uh, had a lot of video games and that was just money to me. Um, my parents' jewelry, you know, stuff like that. Anything that could have put money in my hand, I was going to sell. There were times when they wouldn't let me come in their house because they were afraid I'd steal from them. Um, I remember saying, like, I'll clap my hands so you know that, like, I'm not taking anything. Um, but I, I would have found a way, you know? <laughs> like, even if I had to, like, just use my elbows, I would have found some way. One time I had gotten an iPod Touch, one of those little tiny nano ones that had the touch screen. I got that for Christmas and I had a MacBook Pro and I had no money. And I gave that to my dealer for a bundle of dope. And I went to an alleyway and I did it all at once. And I remember looking up at the, you know, the arch there and just like saying like, just please just take me. <laughs> like, just, just put me out of my misery. Like, I'm, I'm just done. You know, I wiped out my whole computer to sell it. You know, I just, I had no intentions of coming back. I was really, I felt like I was really ready. I, I somehow woke up um, and, you know, there were needle, there was a needle strewn about and, you know, a bunch of bags around me. And I don't know how no one saw me or anything, you know, I, something was looking out for me, I guess. <laughs> not I guess, I know. You're not gonna stop using until you're ready to. And it, it's so, it hurts me so much to say that because I really want to like give people this fantastic advice. It's like you can save them, you know, and you can do this, and it'll make them want it. And and there really isn't anything like that, you know. I feel like there were many times when I've really wanted it. I've really wanted to stay clean, and for whatever reason, you know, I just I wasn't ready to. It's hard to keep hope. I can definitely tell it was very difficult for my parents to keep hope alive. I'm sure there were many times where they were pretty ready to bury me. I, I know that they had had my um, obituary planned. They kind of had it planned what they were going to say if I died. I had been using a needle over and over again and it must have had bacteria in it and bacteria traveled through my arm and settled in my leg. Um, and I had, I woke up one morning with about a softball-sized abscess on, on my thigh. So that was a big wake-up call. That was the first time when I really saw what I'd done to myself. The one time that I did say, I want to go, you know, um, I got out, I relapsed again, and then after that, I got clean. There are so many things in my life that are so beautiful now that I, I can't imagine ever going back to using. The adolescent brain is uh, more responsive to um, the rewarding properties of drugs. 
they're also less responsive to the aversive properties of drugs. It's a kind of a double whammy. And um, on top of it, then, we have a, the, the brain developing, and the part of the brain that we know is still very much in development is the prefrontal cortex. And that is the part of the brain that really needs to, uh, to be engaged in order to make good decisions. So adolescents are inclined by their very nature to make risky decisions. And, um, you know, drugs are, are really a, a kind of a one-way, it's a one-way track. And um, when they make that decision, they're, they're potentially in trouble right away. I normally go probably like 8.30, maybe 9 o'clock at the latest, so it's, I'm, I have like goosebumps, um, I'm a little clammy, my nose is runny, and I'm just kind of shaky, but it's, it's, the difference between that and heroin withdrawal is the mental part of it. With the heroin withdrawal, you have those feelings, but you also have this like screaming in your brain saying, you can fix this, you can fix this, like you don't have to feel this way. Um, and with this, maybe it's because it's so easy to not feel this way. You know, there's not all the stuff to go through to get the drugs. You know, I just have to go to a clinic, walk in, and I'm out. And to me, that doesn't seem like much of a sacrifice. I don't really care if I'm, you know, fixing one drug for another if my life is the way it is now. It feels like I have, like, a life that I never thought I could have. <laughs> I've tried Suboxone, I've tried therapy, I've tried, you know, regular counseling, I've tried psychotherapy, I've tried DBT, you know, CBT, everything you can think of. Um, and I feel like methadone was that component that was missing. He's a smart guy. It's definitely been hard to find the puzzle pieces that kind of fit to find, you know, that perfect balance for me, but I think I'm almost there. I'm pretty close at least. <laughs> I just got off parole about two, three weeks ago now. And, oh, actually, it's been a month now. Oh my gosh, it's going so fast. <laughs> if I had violated my parole, I would have been sent back to jail for five years. And I managed to make it through. I keep myself busy. I think that's important, you know, in early recovery and throughout, you know, just to not be too busy, but to have a, enough things to do that you don't have idle time to um, sit and overthink things. Or sometimes if I am in a quiet room or even going to sleep at night, I'll torture myself, not be able to stop thinking. I'll have flashbacks, you know, I can hear people's voices. Very vivid flashbacks of some traumatic experiences from using. So that, that can be hard. I have moments where I'll think to myself, in a previous place, I would have wanted to use, but I can identify that I would in the past, but it's not there now. I can just see that it would have brought it out in the past. It's hard for folks that haven't had an addiction to understand how controlling that is for people. And even in people in recovery, you know, that one day at a time, I mean, a lot of people who haven't had uh, an addiction sort of think that's a nice little euphemism. For somebody in recovery, that's a real thing. Sometimes it's not a day at a time, it's an hour at a time, it's a minute at a time, because their brain, particularly early on in recovery, is screaming at them, you need this, you need this, you need this. And so they may be absolutely committed to their recovery, but it doesn't make the brain stop screaming that at them. Uh, and so a lot of times they're trying to fix things, they're trying to fix relationships and jobs, and they have legal problems now, which are all hard enough to fix but they're trying to fix that now while the brain's screaming at them, you really need this, you really need this, you really need this. It seems to be a terribly difficult feeling to overcome. And um, individuals will relapse after months or even years of abstinence if they get re-exposed to certain cues uh, or if they have to go to the hospital and go on a pain medication, um, they will relapse after many years. We forget sometimes that we're you know, physiological beings and our brains are made to learn and they're made to remember, they're made to remember for a lifetime. And in, usually that's a wonderful thing and it's very valuable, protects us. But um, in this case, uh, it's harmful.
with more attention to looking back and seeing all the risks and benefits, they are simply not as safe or as effective medicines as we thought they were. So we're tending to use them less frequently. And when we're using them, we're, we're deploying many, many more monitoring techniques to them, prescription drug monitoring program, urine drug screens, pill counts, controlled substance agreements, so that when we use them, we can have a higher level of confidence that they're going to be used safely. We take a, an oath in medicine to do no harm, and so we really, um, when looking back, we need to put more processes in place to make sure that when we're prescribing these medicines, we're not doing harm. One of the biggest challenges is there's people on, there's a large number of people on opiates already. The pharmacies in Pennsylvania or anyone that dispenses the medicine is required now, after January 1, to put in that I gave, you know, Chris uh, 30 oxycodone, uh, enter that in the system within 24 hours of passing it over to the counter to the patient. They're also required to say who wrote that prescription, what office it came from, and how it was paid for, cash, uh, insurance. So what I'm looking for when I have a, a controlled substance agreement with a patient and an understanding is I'm looking for uh, no surprises. So I, I, I want to see that I'm the only one prescribing controlled drugs, that they're getting it about once a month, which is what I prescribe for most people, and that they're paying for it with whatever they pay for their health care. So, uh, so the alternative is when I get on and I see people are getting it from me and three dentists and they're paying for mine with insurance, but the other one's in cash, that's a big big red flag. We found some folks that when we checked that were like, wow, there's something that I didn't suspect. I would have never thought this person's having another challenge that I didn't know about. 